Good morning, brothers and sisters in the faith. What an awesome, wonderful feast it is on so many wonderful levels. It's a time of rejoicing, of fellowshipping, of learning, of experiencing the good things for old and young alike and for wherever we've been. Oh, wonderful. I may need that later. Thank you. It's, it's one of, probably one of the most needful times for the people of God, our, His children. We know from Scripture it's God's appointed time. And we come here by His presence, by His will, by the motivation of God's Spirit working in our lives. And we are recipients of His grace. We are recipients of His mercy and His love in our lives. And, and I think for the people of God, we get a level of encouragement and enthusiasm that can carry us for another 51 weeks of the year. And God knows what he does when he sets appointed times and, and commands and encourages and inspires us to gather together. Yet the reality is that God hasn't called us to bask in our own salvation. He's called us to reflect his light. He calls us to be about his work. He wants us to be what we might term vibrant agents of his grace in a world that's broken, suffering, and in deep trouble. And to be about God's work, we heard earlier in the feast, the greatest commandment is to love God with all our heart, and all our mind, and all our soul, and all our strength. It comes from knowing God and being known by Him. It comes from he that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so we gather each day during the feast and every Sabbath and all our lives with expectant hearts, with willing ears to listen to God. And God strengthens us and God encourages us and God empowers us. But there is also another reality. When Jesus was on this earth, he said, pick up your cross and follow me. And what did he mean by that in the context of 2011? We understand from Jesus' words when he said, pick up your cross and follow me, that there is a level of burden. There is work to do. There is a direction to go. So we're not just floating in the medioc twilight of mediocrity, not knowing what we do and wh where we are in the churches of God. So can I ask, what illusions or what are our perceptions about the Christian calling that God has given us? If you've got a Bible there, turn to John 15 verse 18. Because these are the very words of Jesus. He speaks to us and I give thanks to God that Jesus does not sugarcoat the words that he gives to us. In John 15 verse 8, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you? If you were of the world, in verse 19, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And so remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my word, they will keep yours as well. So we quickly learn as we look at six billion people in the world and we get our calculator on our mobile phone and do a little bit of maths that if we add up all the peoples around the world celebrating at this time of the year and God's presence at his appointed time, we would probably find that we, not, we don't amount to many people. I was listening to Marty Cobb talking about sharing the gospel in other parts of the world. We're in our prosperous world that we live in. It's hard ground. It's challenging going. You know, we read from Jesus' words, not many wise, not many noble are called. We are, must realise that we are living in an increasingly secular age. God is becoming less popular. I delighted to drive from Denver right across the section of the United States to here to Tennessee because people told me, John, you're driving through the Bible Belt. And I saw evidence of Christian faith throughout these communities and I give God thanks. But the country down under that I come from, God is not popular. Six months before our Prime Minister took on the office of Prime Ministership, she made a proclamation saying Australia is now a secular country. And for me personally, that was deeply saddening. 
In Australia, God is not no longer in our schools or in our workplaces. I know Britain in the, U in the Euro is the most secular of all the European countries. Isn't that amazing? When I think of Britain, I think of Big Ben and Westminster Abbey. But times are changing and it's a subtle onslaught. I uh, participate in a couple boards in Western Australia and if God gets mentioned in this course of a meeting, it's an awkward moment. We quickly don't want to include in the minutes, kind of environment in which we're inherited. And so that places a greater challenging on us as brothers and sisters in the faith, following in the footsteps of Jesus, to be about effectively his work, to articulate the greatest news that we could ever have. And sometimes we can think, wow, Noah's evangelism over so many years building the ark didn't yield much fruit. And didn't Jesus say, as in the days of Noah, shall it, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man? And we wonder what that means. We are dealing with a hard secular ground for the seeds of the gospel to be planted. And yet you and I know we have been given the best news we could ever hear. On a family level, some of the best news we could ever hear is when you receive that auntie, your, grand, your daughter has just had a new baby. Or somebody in the neighbourhood has a new baby and the phone calls go around and everyone, oh this is awesome news. And today with internet and with mobile phones and other methods of communication, news spreads like wildfire. We have been given the most awesome insight into the heart and mind and plan of God. Why he created us, what he's doing, what he promises beyond this life. It's awesome. And yet as we look through the pages of the scriptures, we see the same commission, the same message given through prophets and various men of old, and we see their journey. For example, God said to Isaiah, his commission was, and we read that in chapter 58 verse 1, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sins and the house of Jacob their transgressions. That was one pity. Do you think that message would have made Isaiah time person of the year? Do you think that he would have won the popularity stakes? Because often when God sent a prophet, it wasn't to pat you on the back. It was to bring you a message from God to speak to the social consciousness of a whole nation or other nations. You know, the prophets at times were driven to despair. Elijah was the great archetype prophet. And he sat down one day and he said, God, it's too much from me. Take my life. I'm over it. And God says, I have 7,000 people who haven't bowed their knees to Baal. So a prophet's work wasn't easy. It was challenging the core of the men who, who lived and walked that. And we are glad that today we are part by God's grace and his mercy and nothing to do with us of calling us and placing us in families and communities and churches of God. In this day and age, it's a miracle that we are sitting here today. And all the praise and the glory and honour goes to the great living God. Then in the spirit and power of Elijah, same message, word differently, to a different time came John the Baptist. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Same message, different man, same spirit we learn. And it's a message that carries on through the heartthrob and the activities of the various churches of God throughout this earth. You know, our confession is at this feast that the centre of this feast is Jesus Christ. The centre of our worship, of our praise, of our understanding of what holds everything together, what, what was done on our behalf and what's going to be done for all humanity is Jesus Christ. Every song we sing, every message we preach, every prayer we offer is in Jesus' name, to his glory and honour. And it is Jesus who commissions us, who encourages us, who empowers us. He is the one who gives us the strength. He came once as a small baby. He lived 33 and a half years and then was crucified. He was resurrected and he's coming back again. And he's not coming again as a suffering saviour. He's coming back in might, in power, in fury, and in justice in his right hand. And we look forward to that time. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we won't be unpopular as Christians because we're quiet, because we are fearful, 
No, we've been entrusted with the oracles of God, the very words of Jesus Christ. And carrying the cross of Christ requires effort. It's a burden. And in so many places in Scripture, it says, He that endures to the end. And God gives us a burden. He wants us to grow and mature. And sometimes it takes the anvil of challenge, of pain, of circumstances when we're beyond our own comfort zone. And we cry out to God, God help me. And somewhere from a surprising place, God intervenes in our life over and over again. And yet God knows our frailty. And he knows our strengths. And he knows our weaknesses. And Jesus' words are also comforting and encouraging and compelling. He says to us, you are the light of the world. And light by its very nature cannot be obscured by darkness. John writes of God. He says, God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. And when I learned that a few years ago, I knew that I could put my trust in God. Totally. And if you're thinking about becoming baptised and you're, you're on the wondering and you're weighing up everything, there's no darkness in God in the calling and the care and the commissioning and the empowering that God gives. And we are called to reflect the glory and light of Jesus Christ. The audience, the climate that we work in is challenging. John 3.19, I'll quote it for you. John writes, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And the call of God is, don't give up sharing the good news. It's the best news ever. And so we must continue in personal witness. The churches of God must continue their outreach to the peoples of the world because we are the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the body of Christ serving in the communities, wherever God has placed us. And so we use multimedia, we use magazines, we use outreach, we use radio, we use television, we use media streaming and we talk to our neighbours over the back fence and we comfort people by their bedsides wherever God has placed us to be about sharing the good news. And part of that journey is recognising the young people within our midst to mentor and encourage and bless them into godly service. That's part of the role of the body of Christ. And so my happiest memory is as a boy growing up was always looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles. Because for me it meant travel. It meant new places, meeting old friends and making new friends. It was underlined by a theme of God. That's why we come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Because of God, His Son, His Kingdom. And we have a responsibility today, and I feel it as a dad, and my dad feels it as a grandfather who's still a man of faith in almost 80, that we, there's a responsibility to help our younger people to catch the vision. Because there's a lot of distraction out there. Growing up in the faith, there was a lot of boys my age. Most of them, sadly, no longer walk in faith. A few of them do, and I give God thanks for that. There is an attrition rate that exists in this world where the devil is active. And so the churches of God must be strong and prevail against the gates of hell. Number one, for our young people and all of us to know that God is our Father. That Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made, not after primeval slime, no, in the image and likeness of God. And for also our young people to be aware of the thorns and the thistles and pitfalls that exist in this life. And so our lives in this feast is a dedication and a celebration of the God who saves us. And as parents and as grandparents, as pastors, as grandmothers, as mentors in the faith, one of the greatest tools at our disposal is to go before the living God in prayer and beseech him to strengthen us so that the churches of God may endure and remain strong and that the fruit that God, the children that God blesses us with are there to carry the banner for the next generation. Because God not only saves us from this world, he saves us from ourselves. He protects us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation, prayed Jesus, but deliver us from evil. 
And that ought to be our prayer every day. God saves us from the natural course that will eventually destroy this cosmos, this earth. Then it's God who provides for us. He leads us in good pastures. Jesus tells us that there's more yet to come. Hence this message is titled, Unfinished Business. Jesus is gone to prepare a place for us. And if we marvel at the physical creation that we can see, what exists beyond, if it takes the work of Jesus to prepare that place for us, must be awesome. It's only the Holy Spirit that brings it to mind. And yet we do live in a world of good and evil. We live in a world where Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon, the distractions of this life that tear us away. Because we have been blessed to live in one of the most prosperous times ever in human history. Never before have so many people been blessed with so much abundance. And I can almost hear God's voice speaking to Abraham three and a half, four thousand years ago. And those blessings have reached to us today. But materialism can blind. It does blind. And there were people in Peter's day who couldn't see past their own short-sightedness. 2 Peter 3.9, and I think it's worth turning there because it talks about the people of his day and the type of people that we may encounter when we're involved in sharing the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Peter writes to the people of his day, and this is some 2,000 years ago, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but the Lord is long-suffering toward us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, that is, unexpectedly, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, and both the earth and the works that are it will be burned up. So then in, in, in verse 11 he says, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, the materialism on which we anchor our heart and soul sometimes inadvertently, even as people of God, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming day of God? And that's part of the reason why we're here, to recapture that vision, to be inspired that that day of God is coming because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt in fervent heat. And as I sat in on one of the seminars this morning, presented by Hugh Buchanan, I went, Amen. It reminded me of an, a reality that science says Amen to, of which Peter alludes to in the scripture there. Scientists predict that in approximately four or five billion years' time, the sun is going to run out of the hydrogen that fuels it. And as a result of the enormous gravitational pull inward, the sun will reach a, a point of critical mass. And when that sun does that in four or five billion time, years' time, the sun will then explode in a massive fireball. And our solar system, including the Earth, won't exist anymore. And if we put the scriptures together, God tells us that one day everything that we see around us that seems so real won't be anymore. And Peter reminds his audience, what sort of godly persons ought you to be? God says that one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And the path to that centres on the person and the work and the saving of Jesus Christ. And when I think about that, and I imagine that scenario, our artist's conception there, it sounds like hell. And it will be hell. Thankfully, there's hope. Jesus is coming back with unfinished business and bring closure to our waiting hearts. God came to this earth as a baby boy. He was born to, in Bethlehem to Mary by the Holy Spirit. And this same God took upon himself our sins, our misdeeds, and he paid for it by his very own blood. Scripture tells us there can be no remission of sins unless the shedding of blood. And it's this same God who's coming back again. We celebrate that. We anticipate that. We also know there's work to be done. And we are called to be that. 
Peter reminds his audience that God is not slow regarding his promise as we count time. When I was a boy, I thought I'd already be in the kingdom. And that might be true for some of us here. Jesus has unfinished business. And it came out in Jesus' parables so many times. In Luke 19 we read, where Jesus tells a parable, he says, A certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. And we know the rest of the parable. We look forward to the return of Christ. And God does everything decently in order. And one of the areas of unfinished business that was brought out in that wonderful piece of special music that was presented to us prior to this message was that God is going to raise the righteous back to life. Think about that for a moment because... If the resurrection, the death and resurrection, was one of the most pivotal, most essential moments of history, imagine the next pivotal moment when the voice of God calls out and the righteous in Christ are raised. Can you imagine? This will be a moment that will be always spoken of forever in history because it's the work of Jesus. It's His voice. It's His purpose. It's by His will. And we are being given a glimpse of that today. And we hold dear to it. It will be the moment of glory. Remember when Jesus was resurrected around that time, if you read the book of Matthew, there was a massive earthquake through Jerusalem. And the power of Jesus' resurrection affected saints who were lying in their graves and they came around alive as we read just a brief passage there. The resurrection of the righteous will reverberate through the entire universe, not just Jerusalem. And the righteous will hear the voice of the Son of God and stand in glory. And we wait for that time and we know that that will come true. And we read Paul gives a little bit extra details. He says, those who sleep in Christ will rise first. The righteous will rise. So if you think about people you know who've died, if you stood by the lonely cemetery as the pastor read a few words and said a few eulogies, and you took a deep breath and you wiped those tears from your eyes, you know that your loved one one day will hear the voice of the Son of God and be raised to life. And that's awesome and that's worth celebrating and it's worth reminding. So can I ask you, in Jesus' ministry during his 33 and a half years, three and a half years that he ministered, how important was all this? Do we gain some clues? I'm going to turn to John 6 verse 39. John 6 verse 39. Because we know that Jesus prayed, Thy kingdom come. So how could the king pray, Thy kingdom come, when the kingdom centres on him? I know that today you and I are citizens of that kingdom. But there is also a future reiteration of that kingdom in all its glory, which we have not yet seen. And it is coming. John 6 verse 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me, of, that of all that he has given me, I should lose none, nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Take notice of that. But should raise it up at the last day. And verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I will, says Jesus. In verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So 25 or 30 years later, when John remembered those words and started committing it to parchment, he remembers the multiple reiterations of Jesus' words. Dropping down to verse 53, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And in verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Do you see in those four references how important it is to Jesus? In his thinking, in his ministering to these Galilean men and to the people in Judea and beyond. I will, says Jesus, raise him up in the last day. We know that Jesus means what he says. His word is truth. And on that truth, we can have confidence.
I love the scripture in John 5, 28, 29, when Jesus says, All who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who've done good to a resurrection of life. And I'm glad Jesus means what he says and that we can put faith on his words, the words of the Son of God. I love the book of Hebrews. And now I turn to the faith chapter, Hebrews 11. I see the names of saints, of men and women who now lie silent in their graves. And Hebrews tells us they have not yet received their reward. And I'll read some of their names out. These are the people that Jesus is thinking of. Not only of his generation, but for all those people who lived before he ministered on this earth and all those of us who yet still are journeying in that journey. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. People just like you and me who lived in ordinary and extraordinary times. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob. Joseph. Moses. Rahab. And you know all the stories that surround these great people of the Bible that strengthen and speak to us today. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephna, David, Samuel and the prophets. These people have their names written in the book of life. Now naturally we want to know more, don't we? Our Western mind likes to explore the details and I think Jesus understood the longing of his disciples to know more so there's a road map, the last book of the Bible. It's a broad, expansive, brushstroke picture. And we pick at it and we try to understand it and we try to make sense of it, you see. One of the things that Jesus encourages, he says, I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. And John was privy as an old man sitting on the Isle of Patmos when God, Jesus visited him with a vision. And it helps us to understand what God is planning, what he's doing. We read of world government. We read where the saints are persecuted in a unique time in history. We read of wars and pestilences and, 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 and things that we don't even like to talk about. You wouldn't read some of Revelation to your children as bedtime stories. No. And we read also where two witnesses are killed and raised in three days. And we try to make sense of it and try to understand what Jesus has in store for all people. Most of us here are of average intellect. And God tells us clearly, he said, I don't call the noble and the wise, I call the, the humble, that no man should glory. But there was one man that I used to like to watch on ABC television in black and white many years ago when I was a boy. That was Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan had a unique high intellect. He worked for NASA, he was involved, involved with the space program. And he was an astrophysicist and he was involved with the Voyager 1 program where they sent a tiny spacecraft up into space to take some of those early measurements. And at a particular point, Carl Sagan, before Voyager left our solar system and got too far away where we had no radio signal, he organised that the, the, the little Voyager 1 would turn back towards Earth. And where you see that blue circle, that's a picture of Earth as photographed from Voyager 1. I want to read to you what Carl Sagan talks about when he describes this as a pale blue dot. Now remember, he's a man who's much brighter than I am. And he has a great understanding and he's contributed a lot to the NASA program, etc. But listen, listen to this, and it might help us understand the challenges that we face as human beings apart from the Spirit of God. Carl Sagan writes, from this distant vantage point, the earth might not seem of any particular interest, but for us, it's different. Look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every father and mother, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. 
He writes, think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings our imagined self-importance, he writes, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pay light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, he writes, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come elsewhere to save us from ourselves. A, a delusion that we are privileged. The very fact that we assemble here because we know we are created in the image and likeness of God. But there's a man in all his brightness, and I don't, I don't play him down because he is a bright man. He's contributed a lot to our understanding of the world and the universe, etc. But he see, calls it a delusion to think that we are privileged. Not even a hint that some help will come from elsewhere. That's the brightness of human intellect apart from God. We are hopeless. We are doomed to be destroyed in four billion years' time if we get that far. We live in a godless, secular age that's crept up on us. And I know that Britain and Australia and USA have Christian Judaic roots. It's written in our law systems. If you wander to the lonely old cemeteries of 100, 150 years ago, read those old epitaphs and you know we were a Christian nation. But a rising tide of secularity in politics and elsewhere. You know, our landscapes were once dotted by church spires. Today, every new suburb that pops up in Australia is denoted by first the shopping centre and then the recreational facilities. Our priorities have changed. And it's happened over a generation. This is the generation that our youth are inheriting. And if it wasn't for the sure words of God, you can share the sentiment of the hopelessness we would otherwise feel. But God has called us to focus our eyes on Jesus, on his words, to inspire, to equip, to educate, to mentor, to pray for, and invest every bit of godly insight in those one, young ones that God has given us. God help us to do this in every prayer. The very fibre and the nature of the churches of God. Long time ago, God told Moses that his time was over. He reached 120 years and young Joshua, I say young Joshua, he was 40 at that time and God wanted to pass the baton on to the next generation. Can you imagine the shoes that Joshua would have to fill in General Moses, the work that Moses did for the children of Israel over those 40 years? There were expectations that I think our young people equally wrestle with as they come to faith and catch the vision of the Kingdom of God. I want to turn, if you'd like to turn with me as well, to Deuteronomy 31. Because God spoke to Joshua because he understood the human frailties we sometimes carry when God calls us to do big things. Joshua, um, Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. Because I'm sure God heard the prayers of Joshua as well. Remember when Moses used to stand in the tabernacle of meeting in the pillar of cloud speaking to God? Joshua didn't go in there at the time. Joshua always stood outside. Now Joshua was going to step up one. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. This is the words of God telling Moses to convey to Joshua. Don't fear them or be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. And in verse 7, then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of good courage. For you must go with this people to the Lord, which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And Joshua was pointing out, whoa, oh, Joshua, Moses, can you hang around a bit longer? You've done a pretty good job so far. Verse 8, and the Lord 
He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. Don't fear and don't be dismayed. And those words reach across to us today, to a new generation. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. I will be with you, says God. And we are too, in this age, like the ancient Israelites, journeying through a wilderness, a time of sin, and we could draw the analogies with ancient Israel and us today, etc., etc. For Joshua, there was a lot of unknowns. Okay, we have the benefit of hindsight, we have the historical, biblical record. But for Joshua, he was on the thresh of human history. And he was wearing a lot of weight on his shoulders. The empowering words of God will be with you. Don't be afraid of them. Be of strong and good courage can be empowering. Children, can I have your attention if you've, if you've slightly switched off? Do you know Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh Bear? It's a popular cartoon series and it's, you probably find one almost in every house in the Western world. They're beloved stories that speak to our children. So Christopher Robin is a boy and he's got the little bear there. And then many times children are privy to their conversations. And one day they're sitting down on a raft and listen to the words of Christopher Robin to his pet toy bear. He says, if, there ever, if ever there is tomorrow when we are not together, there is something you must always remember. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. But the most important thing is, even if we're apart, I will always be with you. We are braver and stronger and smarter, not because of a high IQ, because of God's grace, because of his love, because of his dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. This was a story for children that we can extract parallels. And it speaks to us. Somebody once said, Tom Krause said, courage is a discovery that you may not win and trying when you know that you can lose. I don't think Joshua carried that in his heart as he stepped out in faith. I believe courage is more than that. A faith, an assurance based on the very words of God. We do win because we're following Christ and we take encouragement from that. When I was a young man, I think the first time I led worship services, or the very first time I gave a short message at church, and I was trembling and I trying to, after sitting in church for 20 years doing nothing, finally you sort of get the call and God buffets you around and says, come on, step up, Sam. I stepped down in the audience. As soon as the church service was finished, the senior elder came up to me and he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, in this lifetime, there's so many critics and we can always pick holes in things. He said, I just want to encourage you. And he gave me some warm, encouraging words that swept away those fears of inadequacy. The power we have in a kind word in the reassurance that we can extend to the next generation that's coming up. I didn't know that those would be his last words to me. He shortly thereafter died from a heart attack. And so as I thought about it, you know when somebody gives you their last words, they really stay on your heart? And for me as a young man growing up in the faith, I've carried that with me for years. The warm, encouraging, affirming words. And I give thanks to God for that. There's one thing in Scripture that is in our favour, and it pays due to remember that. Turn to 1 John 4, verse 4. 1 John 4, verse 4. Actually, I've got it up on screen. John writes a pastoral letter to those people of his days, and he says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He writes, my little children, can you sense the care, the pastoral affection? And the real shepherding words of John reminds us that he who is in, in you is greater than he who is in the world. So when you're faced by insurmountable odds, when the seeds of the gospel seem to fall on dry soil, remember, he who is in us is stronger than he in the odds that are in the world. What about the final words Jesus gave to Peter along the journey? They were 
the end of Jesus was resurrected, the disciples were confused, they were hurt, they would saw their Lord and Master crucified in the most agonizing, most horrible form of Roman torture, and they were confused. They went fishing. That's all they knew as young growing boys. So Jesus meets them on the shore, and he cooks some fish and there's some bread there. And as they're walking after breakfast, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. Love you, and he says, feed my lambs, or feed my sheep. And they walk a little bit further, and Peter, Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, I do love you. We're mates, we're buddies, we're pals. You're the son of God. Remember his declaration earlier. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And the third time, you know it's funny when God reiterates himself twice or three times, it really stirred Peter up. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, be about my work. Feed my sheep. Pastors, elders, mums and dads, grandparents, disciples of Christ, do you sense that call in your life to be responsible and accountable for those God has given you? We all do. Those are Jesus' commissioning words to a man of Peter 2,000 years ago. But they speak intrinsically to us today. Feed my sheep three times. I will raise him up at the last day four times. I'm encouraged and inspired as we explore these scriptures together because they're all underscored by Jesus' words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we hold on to these words. They're powerfully motivating. They're extraordinarily encouraging. They reassure us. And they reassure our young ones. And we are called in an age and a time never before in human history. I want to um, read one of the passages of the churches of God because if you've lived around for the last 15 or 20 or so years, you may have, your journey may have been rocky as well. You may, may have found yourself having to make big decisions to call out to God in prayer because your journey has been personally challenged. You found that you could not look on anyone else but Jesus Christ. But I rejoice because no matter how challenging it is, there is a narrow gate that leads to life. And we, God always provides. And he'll never leave us or forsake us. One of the churches of God on their website wrote a passage, and if you're from that particular church, you'll recognise those words. He writes, We live in a time when many of the faithful have been scattered. The darkness of our world and the coldness of so many religious leaders make it a challenge for God's children to find safe pastures. We believe God will provide the shepherds. We believe those leaders provided by God will be different than those who came before less invested in corporate mentality, less interested in control, more given to loving leadership, more generous in service, less arrogant, less contentious, more humble, more patient with the imperfections of their brethren. We're living in that era now, in that journey where the, the, the foundation of what we understood to be the church of God has changed. And we recognise the body of believers in Christ in all places and corners of this earth. And we give God thanks. I am glad that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And that the grace and the love that exists within the churches of God is so much greater than could have ever possibly been before. I am glad there are men and women glad to stand in the gap. I'm glad that God is raising up godly shepherds to nurture and nur love the people of God, to equip the next generation of saints that are pioneering the time, whatever it takes, until Jesus Christ returns so that the gospel may be fearlessly lived and fearlessly preached, so that there is another generation of people who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. So the big question remains for us today, are we up to the challenge? Do we sense the risks, the difficulties? Are we courageous? There's an old proverb that my mum told me. She said, a single ember of coal only holds its heat for so long. But a whole bunch of coals together stays warm the whole night long. And when you, if you've got a wood fire and you open early in the morning and you, you can feel the radiant heat from all those coals, 
We as the churches of God, by sticking together, by loving one another, by encouraging one another, by ministering to each other's congregations wherever God has placed us, will stay warm until Christ returns. We won't turn cold or lukewarm. We'll be burning hot. It's encouraging. We are ahead of our time. We are citizens of that kingdom. The night will be short. The darkness, days are numbered. And Jesus says that those days will be cut short. He'll come like a, a thief in the night. If I turn to the book of Revelation, there are three or four places where Jesus tells us something else on his mind in a repeated fashion, and we'll tie it off there. God, in Revelation 3 verse 10, he speaks to a particular church, and he tells us how quickly he's coming, what's on his mind. Revelation 3 verse 10, Because you've kept the, my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one take your crown. This theme again picks up in Revelation 22. We find the same theme in verse 7 of Revelation 22. Jesus says, Behold, and he's speaking to John in vision, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. In verse 12 of the same chapter, 22, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to each one according to what he has done. And John signs off the book of Revelation, He who testifies to these things, surely I am coming quickly. Here's the words of Jesus reiterated three times. The very last words of Jesus that we have. There is unfinished business. Jesus is eager to complete it. Don't you look forward to the time when you look at the Master's eyes and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and sit at your Master's table. Wow, we've only heard about it through the reading of the words. One day those words will come to existence and you will hear those words from Jesus. It's a vision that sustains us. Let me, let me just quote briefly from Hebrews 8 verse 10. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law into their mind and write it in their heart. We look forward to that time. I will be their God and they will be my people. Verse 11. And they shall not each man teach his neighbour, saying no, each his neighbour and each his brother, saying know the Lord. The work of the churches of God, crying out to a people, saying know the Lord. For all will know me from the least to the greatest. Carl Sagan will come to know God. And I look forward to that time when he will give glory to the God that he never knew. In that day, our work as a people, as the families, as the churches of God, will find complete, completion. We will find closure. We will find rest in Christ. So at this time of God's appointing, in sojourning, in tabernacling, in tenting, where we meet in fellowship with God, may we be encouraged, may we be strengthened, for the journey ahead. The day is far spent, the night is nigh. We look forward to that glorious new dawning. God speed that day. May God bless and strengthen and encourage us, all of us here today.